Good morning and welcome to ICSS Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, let me give a little background on our, on our organization. ICSS is the Institute for the Critical Study of Society which is a Marxist study and research organization associated with the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, California. For the last 15 or so years, we've been presenting um, presentations from various speakers, uh, hopefully from a Marxist perspective on various topics. Um, we, we, uh, we promote Marxism because we, we believe it's the most advanced theory and practice of social study and change, which fortunately is not, a, not available to our enemies, our class enemies. So this is one of the advantages of the proletariat. We have Marxism as a as a tool. Um, so um, uh, to, today we have, we're very fortunate to have a speaker on a topic which will exemplify this work. Our topic today is um, the midterm elections and the state of bourgeois politics. And our speaker is an outstanding Marxist and activist, Roger Harris. Roger has taught political science at a historically black college in Mississippi in the late 60s and was involved in the civil rights movement and community organizing in East Harlem. In a mid-career shift, he returned to school and became a certified wildlife biologist. He is active in local environmental affairs and leads international echo tours for the Oceanic Society. Roger is on the State Central Committee of the Peace and Freedom Party and on the board of the Human Rights Organization, the Task Force on the Americas. He's, a pro, he's on the program committee of the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library at ICSS and the executive committee of the US Peace Council. He is active in the Free Alex Saab and Sanctions kill, Kills campaign. His political writings may be, may be found in Counterpunch, Dissident Voices, Mint Press News, Popular Resistance, and the Orinoco Tribune in Venezuela. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Roger Harris. He will speak, I suppose, for maybe a half an hour or, or more and then we'll have an open discussion. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I think the way we're going to do this, however, is I'm going to ask Alan um, Miller to kick this off. Of course, the purpose of this, this meeting right now is not so much to give a lecture, but to provoke a discussion and an interchange of ideas. And um, so Alan will kick it off with introduction. Um, a lot of the stuff that I'll be saying are ideas that I worked out with Alan, and, and I'm very much indebted to his his, his um, in, input. And so let me turn this over to Alan, then I'll do a, um, a I hope, um, not a very long um, presentation, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Alan? Okay, thank you, Roger. Let me go ahead and uh, start off by sharing my screen. You guys see my screen now and hear me? Yes, Alan. You guys hear? Oh, okay. A little louder. Right. A little bit louder. Okay. Let me let me try and fix that. Hold on. Sorry.
can you hear me now? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Okay. All right. Sorry. Let me share my screen. Okay. For, I'd like to start off by asking a question. How many of you um, saw Biden's speech the other day on uh, the soul of the nation? Uh, this is a, a screenshot from the speech. And I would like to start off by saying that I found the speech horrifying absolutely horrifying. But more than that, what I'd like to say is that I find the general political situation in this country today horrifying. And I'd like to say a few words about, about Biden's speech and some of the things that are, that are going on today. So let me start off with uh, uh, Biden spoke a lot about the election nullification that's being carried out by the Republican Party. And let me start off by just uh, giving you a quick uh, video clip of some uh, statements by Democrats on the 2016 and 2020, uh, 2016 election. You guys see the screen now, the video? Yes, Ellen. We're not we're not hearing the video though. No hit no sound on the video? No. Sorry, sorry. I got it. I'm on top of it. Sorry. How can you win with Russian interference, though? That's, That's a what real I'm thing. I'm scared about no, in 2020. But, but rightly. Because right. I think he's an illegitimate president that didn't really win. So how do you, you know, fight against that in 2020? You are absolutely right. He is an illegitimate president in my mind. Would you be my vice president for Canada? <laughs> Folks, look, I absolutely agree. Trump didn't actually win the election in 2016. He lost the election, and he was put in office because the Russian <laughs> interfered. Trump knows he's an illegitimate president. The president elect, although legally elected, is not legitimate. I don't see this president elect as a legitimate president. You said you believe that Russia's interference altered the outcome of the election. I do. We have a president who, if in fact it is proven, uh, has been assisted by the Russians and may in fact not be a legitimate president. <clears throat> the one thing that Trump is fearful of uh, when it comes to his being president is that finally we will see how illegitimate his victory actually was. I have an objection. I object to the 15 votes from the state of North Carolina. I object because people are horrified. He's an illegitimate president. Do you believe Trump is a legitimate president? What I believe is that there's no question that the outcome of this election was affected by the Russian interference. But there absolutely is a cloud of illegitimacy. So that legitimacy is in question, yes. So that was a very tainted election. And and then that's okay. Um, so that's just a taste. There's actually 10 minutes of those clips. Taste of uh, the aftermath of the 2016 election. And this, I think it's really important to put. Biden's speech last week in the context of that sort of talk on the part of the Democrats to really frame this question about democracy and election nullification to show that, in fact, election no. nullification has been going on for a long time and it's being carried out by both parties. In fact, if you look at uh, opinion polls, more Democrats actually denied Trump's election in 2016 than Republicans who denied Biden's in 2020. 
one third of House Democrats boycotted Trump's election. So if you really look at this election nullification and denial, it's a bipartisan phenomenon. The bourgeois political parties, capitalist political parties, they just go about it in different ways. Sometimes we have voting rights suppression on the part of the Republicans. Other times we have ballot access obstruction on the part of the Democrats. We have state repression of dissent and protest by both Democrats and Republicans. And most recently, we've had a lot of big tech censorship on the part of Democrats. Both parties are promoting divisions among the people. The Republicans are promoting outright racism and immigrant bashing using dog whistles by Trump. The Democrats are targeting the quote deplorables, which are really MAGA Republicans who are often distressed white workers and small business owners who are looking for relief from the problems that they're suffering. Our framing really needs to be not on the Republicans or the Democrats, but on the failure and degeneration of capitalist politics, bourgeois politics and the capitalist system in general. And to put this in some context, let's just take what I thought would be a quick look at some of the problems that we're facing today in the context of this political infighting that's taking place. People today are facing inflation and rising interest rates, an obscene rise in the cost of living. We're facing an endless pandemic and public health crisis. We're facing a his historically declining standard of living and life expectancy. We're facing obscene rising inequality in both American society and on a world scale. We have parasitic financial speculation, derivatives, stock market, uh, uh, rise and fall in the stock market, endless violence, mass shootings, lethal racist attacks and attacks against women, endless military spending, money being shipped overseas in the tens of millions and a billions on a daily basis to Ukraine. We have low paying, dead end, insecure jobs in the workforce. We have a collapsing infrastructure. We have an ongoing opioid epidemic claiming the lives of tens of thousands of people, especially in depressed areas like the Midwest and West Virginia coal mining areas. We have crushing debt, student debt, consumer debt. People are borrowing to meet their bills in the face of rising inflation. We have a homelessness crisis here in the Bay Area. This is a homeless encampment underneath the, the uh, BART system here in Oakland. Throughout the United States, homelessness is in, in epidemic proportions. If you really look at this, what's going on today is that we have a multifaceted capitalist crisis. Both ruling class parties are stepping up repression and undermining the norms of bourgeois democracy. They're diverting anger and attention away from the capitalist class, their politicians, and the economic system that's at the root of our problems. The danger and oppression we are suffering today is not due to a single political party. It's the political system and the capitalist economic system that's corrupt, phony, illegitimate, and incapable of addressing the problems that we're facing. And this system, its politics, its culture, society in general is degenerating and disintegrating right before our very eyes. So with that framing and that context, let me turn this over to uh, Roger to continue. Thank you, Alan. And if that doesn't provoke a robust discussion, I'll see if I can add, add to that. 
Um, but I think that's basically the approach and the vision um, to the to the, the contemporary situation that, that I would embrace as well. I want to talk a little bit about the politics of anti-Trumpism and particularly the inadequacy of the left liberal critique of the threat of fascism. The narrow focus by liberal Democrats on the binary choice, what we call lesser evilism, of Republican versus Democrat obscures the larger function of the two party system. It is the two party system as a system that we believe we should focus on and not just the individual merits of the constituent parties. That is, what is behind the political theory theater that we have today, the political theory, the theater of good cop and bad cop. Um, I agree with the liberal Democrats that a reactionary nationalist tendency with fascistic undertones is haunting not only the land of the free, but is also threatening contemporary Brazil, some former Soviet republics, India, South Africa, and elsewhere. However, I differ on both the causes and the potential Remedies. So let's begin with where Alan left with us off, off with the failure of neoliberalism. And we can go back to Bernie's Our Revolution, which ended up hurting the hopeful into the Democratic Party by giving that party a false patina of progressivism. The standards movement reflected a mass disenchantment with the neoliberal model. Indeed, Trump's parallel insurgency cynically seized on the same failure of neoliberalism to meet people's basic needs via a dishonest, pro-populist campaign that portrayed Trump as some kind of man of the people. The failure of neoliberalism partly explains why Make America Great Again, MAGA, resonated with so many U.S. voters, over 70 million voters it resonated with. While the super rich make recreational flights to outer space, neoliberalism, and by that I mean the contemporary form of capitalism, is not meeting people's basic needs. And the two parties of capital collude to shovel taxpayer dollars into endless foreign wars, enough, it should be noted, to alleviate hunger and homelessness at home. Granted, the Trump phenomena is symptomatic of a mounting right-wing false pop populism, but it wouldn't be popular without the disease of a declining standard of living for the working class. The struggle against racism and sexism and, gender, and for gender equality is equated by the Democrats with the broader fight for democracy. Omitted from that litany, are class-based economic issues. While flailing at the symptoms, the Democrats feed the disease. They enthusiastically join their supposed sworn enemies on the other side of the aisle, engorging the military and the security apparatus of the state with more funds than the White House even requests. In practice, both parties agree that anything like Medicare for all is to be deferred and to be deferred indefinitely, even at a time of COVID crisis. The litany of multiculturalism, gender equality, LBGTQ plus rights, environmentalism, and anti-colonialism, anti-racism is cited by the Democrats. And I believe that these cultural identity and lifestyle issues are important, very important, but they cannot be substituted for providing an adequate material basis for daily life for the working class. The Democrats' abandonment of the material interests of their traditional constituencies, constituencies makes them complicitous in the rise of a populist rightist blowback. The resentment of the dispossessed of the use of identity politics as a cover, as a cover for the neoliberal agenda, no way justifies their their racist, white supremacist, anti-immigrant and sexist reaction, but it does deliver them into the open arms of Trump. With little else to offer, Trump is the Democrats' biggest asset. 
we saw that when WikiLeaks revealed that the Hillary Clinton campaign and the DNC were leading promoters of the dark horse Trump candidacy in the crowded 17 contender Republican 2016 primary race. And they're doing that again right now with, um, with extreme Republicans are being supported financially by Democrats right now in the primary elections that are coming up. The Democrats got what they wished for and more as it turned out. The Democrats no longer pretend to have a social welfare agenda. Forget about Joe Biden being the new incarnation of FDR, the former party of the New Deal and now of new neoliberalism only offers as faithful the cold comfort that Trump is not their standard bearer. After the debacle of January 6, 2021, the disgraced 25th president of the United States retreated to a golf course in Florida. He was vilified by the preponderance of corporate media, itself overwhelmingly neoliberal and imperialist, and abandoned by major figures in his own party. Rather than allowing Trump to fade into the shadows, the Democrats have continued to fan the flames of fear of fascism for their partisan advantage. By the same token, though, their publicity helps to mobilize the very right populism that they oppose. Hence, over a year and a half since the original incident on 1-6-21, the House Select investigative committee continue to keep the media spotlight on the former chief executive and with a professional TV producer for the primetime extravaganza. So what happened since that infamous day? Well, the angry Republican mob took selfies at the Capitol and then they went home. They never returned. The angry Republican mob that we're told to fear never returned to the Capitol. Meanwhile, the Democrats had hundreds of the perpetrators pursued, causing some of them to be imprisoned. Under Democratic leadership, the U.S. Army and not the civilian police occupied the streets of the national capital. That's what fascism looks like. And new legislation was passed extending the police, police powers to limit protests. New legislation that will undoubtedly be used against the left. In the name of preserving our democracy and fighting fascism, measures that are in fact fascistic were enacted. What ensued under democratic ages is not what dem democracy looks like. So what is the main danger? The Democrats championing deplatforming dissenting voices from social media is counterposed by them with, by the cancel culture of the right. One justifies or cancels out the other. But we should not dismiss the love affair of the Democrats with the FBI and the CIA. These elements of the deep state are the coercive, coercive apparatus of fascism. With its uncomely embrace of foreign policy neoconservatives, I'll name some names, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, Under Secretary of State Victoria Newland, National Security Advisor, uh, Jacket Sullivan, Director of National Intelligence, April Haynes, and the list goes on. The Democrats have eclipsed the Republicans as a leading party of war. Now even accused war criminal Henry Kissinger stands to the left of the Democrats. While 57 de Republicans demurred, the Republicans, including the squad, including Bernie, unanimously voted to appropriate tens of billions of dollars for the U.S. war effort in Ukraine. Such hyper-aggressive nationalist partisans make untrustworthy books against fascism. So what are the prospects for fascism? Now, quickly um, finish up. A right populist insurgency would provide the shock troops for our future fascism. But that is, is, is clear. But it would be the ruling class or major elements of the ruling class that would opt to no longer maintain their class rule by liberal bourgeois democratic means. If ruling Democrats imposed fascist, excuse me, if ruling elements imposed fascist rule, 
they would have to forego the convenient facade of legitimacy afforded by the current electoral regime, one where corporations are considered persons and buying politicians is considered an exercise of free speech. As long as popular discontent can be confined into the Democrat-Republican duopoly, the two-party system, the ruling parties are mollified to have fascistic measures already in the books used sparingly. And some of those measures are the Patriot Act and the Espionage Act. For now, the cabal of the two parties of capital is content with their theater of bitter contention on cultural issues on one hand and fundamental collusion on matters of state. All the while, the system is lurching in an ever more authoritarian direction, regardless of which party wins electorally in November, the same class will be in power. Thank you. I'll turn this back over to um, Richard. Thank you, um, Roger and Alan. Uh, we'll take a, a short break now to uh, for some announcements. Gene, uh, would you tell us about some of our upcoming uh, programs. Go ahead, Jean. I think you have to. Um, you have to, Jean. You have to. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm on now. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, well. Thank you very much for a thought provoking. Uh, 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 discussion here, and thank you, Roger and Alan, for uh, initiating this. Because uh, as of uh, early last week, we didn't really have any um, any idea what we were going to do. So I, I really appreciate focusing our discussion like this. But we have had a, a lot of discussions on this topic uh, in the past. Um, not the least of which was uh, was Gerald Horn, which was one of our very provocative statements. But, um, uh, okay, so next week is September 18th. We have inflation, stagnation, and recession, prospects for the US and world economy. And I doubt that he will give us much good news, but Michael Roberts, whom we've had before, it will be talking. Uh, the following week, September 25th, we have uh, Socialism Betrayed. We have Roger Karen and Thomas Keeney uh, discussing their book, Social Be Betrayed, Behind the Collapse of the Soviet Union. So we will, uh, looking forward to that. October 2nd, Imperialism Revisited. Our speaker will be Greg Godels, who is uh, uh, very active both in the Marxist library and in uh, Marxism-Leninism today. So I'm looking forward to that. October 9th, uh, we the Elites, Why the Constitution Serves the Few. And I'm sure he will tell us that neither the Democratic Party nor the Republican Party are, the two-party system isn't part of our um, Constitution. In fact, I believe uh, the um, founding um, parents um, uh, were opposed to party formation saw it as an antithetical to democracy. So again, um, great talk, very provocative, and um, looking forward to uh, our discussion. So thank you again. And I think Richard needs to say something about money, which uh, I don't care much about. So go ahead, Richard. Well, thank you. Um, we don't care that much about money either, but we do need some. And I put a, put a, uh, Again, uh, information on how you can contribute to ICSS on the chat. There, there is also a, uh, the same information on your email announcing this meeting. And you can also go straight to our website, icssmarks.org, and you'll see a donate button. So please contribute. With that, I will go into the discussion. Please um, um, raise your hand and um, I will call on you as close as I can to the order, people. So off the bat, we have Raj and Mike G. 
in uh, in the old world. So go ahead, Raj. Uh, okay, thank you, um, Richard, and thank you, Roger, for and Alan, for a very good presentation um, of the issues facing us. Um, <clears throat> Well, the United States never was a democracy. The two parties, it's a duopoly at best. And it is fracturing even at that because the crisis, as you pointed out, is forcing the issue because of what the people want, the capital doesn't, cannot deliver anymore because it's in a stage where it is actually decomposing. It needs Chinese and other workers take profit for itself. So it logically moved there and crushed the American working class power uh, organized under trade unions and otherwise. And, um, and so resistance to that had been so far very poor. Uh, the workers have had few victories and lately they have organized uh, at some levels. But the point is, it is, uh, and so neoliberalism really is a, tactic, uh, I mean, basically logical outcome of the uh, uh, crisis of capitalism, which was that I think they couldn't make the amount of profit they used to be able to make uh, because of the fight the working class here put up and because of Soviet Union. So all of that to me is neoliberalism isn't a policy, but a compulsion. Uh, so that's my comment. But my question is this, it's been 30 years, 32 years, or 31 years since Soviet Union collapsed. And China, uh, despite my good friend Jean's protestation, in my opinion, turned to capitalism. And so uh, 32 years, we have seen only setbacks. Uh, we have not seen any uh, gain of socialism. Workers are not, uh, whether it's India, whether it's uh, United States, elsewhere, even Russia, where, where the communists have a pretty second biggest party. But the point is, generally speaking, worldwide, the workers are not attracted to the uh, socialist model, or so it appears, I may be mistaken. What is the reason in your opinion, Alan and Roger? Either of you, you want to respond or wait for a few more questions? Or... I, I think we should respond to each question, but in, in this case, um, I, I, I don't have an adequate answer. Um, I, 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 I very much appreciate the way Raj formulated the question and, and, and put the context in, but I don't, I mean, that really is the question of how we move the working class struggle forward, Alan? Yeah, again, I think I would agree with Roger that it's, it's a very important uh, framing of the question. You know, just to kind of throw a few ideas out, really we're in a, in a historic uh, transition right now. And uh, the, the left, pretty much has been crushed, was crushed after World War II and with uh, the, the demise of the Soviet Union, things really shifted uh, uh, very much against the working class in the world today, the rise of the neoliberal period. But I think that what's taking place now because the crisis is identifying, we're in kind of an interregnum where there's a transition that's taking place. And some of the things that I think we should be looking at are what is this historic historical period? And the first thing I would say is that the war in Ukraine is really causing the acceleration of these contradictions because what's happening is that there's a polarization that's taking place in the world today. And the economic situation in the world today you're having you're you're seeing these contradictions manifesting themselves in the inflation that's taking place in western europe the energy crisis that's taking place uh it's it's really sort of latin america africa 
and uh, Asia, India, and China lining up against American imperialism on, on the Ukraine question, that this kind of represents the, 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 the decline of the dollar in the sense that the, it, you can sort of see on the horizon that the dollar is being knocked out of place. These are all important kind of world historic conditions and events that are taking place. In addition to that, you are seeing a rise, a beginning of the rise in working class struggle here in the US. You have the rise in unionization among service workers, Starbucks, Trader Joe's. You have some pretty sharp strikes that are taking place, strikes on the horizon like the railway workers. The railway workers in Britain, the rail railway strike in Britain, I think is a very significant development. So really what, we, what we're seeing is kind of like we're in a period of transition. There's a lot of things bubbling up under the surface and what's driving it are these contradictions in the capital system, which cannot be swept aside. This is just not gonna happen. This stuff is gonna manifest itself. And which way it goes, I think a lot of it is up to us at this point. So that's kind of a long answer, but that, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike G, go ahead. Unmute yourself, first Mike G. Is Michael Gilbert. Mike? Okay. Ah, yeah, so sorry about that. I, I was trying to unmute myself. It, it wouldn't take the little red line off, off the um the little uh, icon. Yeah, I mean I I, th I find this really fascinating um because it it, it reflects um, a lot of the things, a lot of the concerns that I've got about the um the state of politics and uh, econ economics and society in in England and in Britain. But um I think the situation in America is, is is far more significant for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons being that you know we we do have and we have had since the end of the Second World War um, something which resembles a kind of redistributive state. So the, the people in this country are nowhere near as badly off as some of your working class people are. Where it seems to me anyway, from the pictures of homelessness under motorway bridges, we you know we don't really have anything that looks as grotesque as that over here. You know, there is an attempt made to sort of locate homeless people into various um, homeless facilities. But the, the question is, though, I mean, you know, what, it, what is behind this? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a global phenomenon across most of the Western world. You know, that the Western world is in decline and the response to capitalism's decline is generally for governments to become more and more authoritarian as a reaction to working people becoming more and more anxious and insecure. Um, and, and I think that was very eloquently described by the two, the two speakers. You know, you're, you're seeing that in America. To some extent, you're seeing a little bit of that sort of thing happening over here. Um, the, 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 the cause of it, I think, um, it, it, the cause of, well, the cause of it, I think, is the other contradictions that the last speaker referred to. I think there are two ph phenomenal contradictions, in my opinion. One is that uh, we, we, we talk about democracy, but it isn't a democracy and it never really has been. It's a two party system It's based on administration and opposition. It's basically attack and, an attack and defend system in which outside voices are, are excluded because there's no place for them in any debate. It's uh, it's the two big parties, both here and in America, that, that have the have access to the, the discussion. But I think for me, the most significant contradiction and the one that I think working people need to be made much more aware of is the fact that we're no longer paying for our so our social system, our welfare system in this country on the back of the profitability of capital, which is what happened after the Second World War. We're, we're paying for it with debt um, and the debt is owned by the working classes. And I mean, for me, that's an even more shocking situation than the situation that we would have had 60 or 70 years ago. So we've got a bourgeois party ratcheting up borrowing to pay for um, a welfare system which working people in this country do benefit from, but ultimately it's the working people who are responsible for paying for it, for their, 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 their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. Um, we've, we've now got a, a scheme to support people with the cost of um, living crisis, the fuel crisis, but again it's all backed with borrowing and it's the working people that, um, that, that are responsible for paying that back. And I think you know, the working working people need to be made much more aware of how the bourgeois system is looking after itself with debt that they're ultimately responsible for paying back. Um, the, the, somebody asked the question, you know, why why don't working people get attracted to socialism? I, I think 
part of the problem with that is, and maybe an explanation for that, is that socialism is generally associated with authoritarianism. And we have to make that, we have to break that link. The, it's, it's sad, but I found that the more we talk about Russia and China, the more people basically don't want to embrace socialist ideas. Um, and socialism is where we need to go to look after the interests of the mass of working people, that great big rump of people in the middle who don't fall hard on the right and don't fall hard on the left, but just get lost in the middle as the two um, other political parties, you know, squabble amongst themselves uh, in a very theatrical way, uh, as happens over here. So I haven't really got a question, um, but uh, I just wanted to make that point that I've really enjoyed the discussion and it does resonate very much with my experience of what's uh, what's happening over here. Thank you. Okay. If I could just quickly um, make a few comments. Mike, I really appreciate that, those comments because I, I learned a lot, um, especially about the issue of debt, um, because that is becoming a looming issue and the, the debt um, issue in the United States is being used to destroy the social safety, welfare, welfare uh, function of, of the state. Um, I, I think on debt, we should understand that states um, have two ways of, of generating revenues. Um, one way is by taxation. Um, and that's the, and as Mike mentioned, they tax the poor, they tax the working people. The other way that states um, can create um, revenues is by paying the wealthy to use their money. And that's what we're seeing right now. The, the debt crisis is really who holds that debt. It's the wealthy institutions that hold the, that, the debt. Um, on the notion of socialism being associated with authoritarianism, um, I, I think that's um, may, may well be true but I don't think it's universally true throughout the world. I'm, I'm fairly active in Latin American politics. And um, when we mention the, the names of China and Russia, they see those countries as people that are in solidarity with them and supporting them. Um, and they don't have the same anti-communist views. Um, I'm making a very broad generalization but th that that bedrock anti-communism that we that we see in the atlanticist group uh, is is not universal th throughout um the world i would, I would just come in i'm sure you agree with that as well thank you okay um gene go ahead on um, yeah uh, okay well, well uh, thank you so much this is very provocative um, however, it, these uh, concepts are not new. They've been discussed uh, among Marxists for some time. And I'd just like to, for my own background, uh, I was um, a, a candidate of the Peace and Freedom Party, the only socialist party on the California ballot, uh, for many years, uh, starting in uh, 1982. Um, and uh, um, so I have some familiarity. I was one of the, spent a lot of time working with peace and freedom, but uh, the, peace and freedom and myself have uh, seen uh, a parting of the ways, let's put it that way, uh, after I started to um, uh, support Bernie. And I think we have to understand the Bernie movement um, has brought socialism back on the agenda. Again, it's a particular kind of uh, uh, socialism, not Marxism, Leninism, but uh, so-called democratic socialism. But again, it is, uh, you know, as, as Bernie pointed out, uh, he won the debate in terms of the generational debate and the fact that socialism is now uh, an acceptable, it was word of the year, uh, actually before Bernie. So uh, it's much more uh, talked about. That being said, um, I wanted to say for today, uh, I, when I read the write-up, and um, I, I started to draft my own statement, which was um, going to be settle for Biden in row vember uh, or row, row, row your vote. And the whole discussion so far has left out the kind of gender fascism, which has uh, come about from, um, you know, the, the, the last 
you know, largely because of Trump. It was Trump, his presidency, that stacked the Supreme Court, the unleashed uh, a whole wor the worst aspects of the fo fossil fuel industry, anti-democratic movements, you know. So, um, you know, I, I have no regrets. However much the Democratic Party may attack Trump, uh, he deserves it. And I can't, I can't understand personally how anybody sees anything in the, in him. He is a reprehensible human being, for that for that matter. So my question is, uh, there's going to be an election coming up in November or November, and one of two parties will emerge victorious. I would like to see peace and freedom. I'd like to see Gloria Lariva uh, become president, but that's not going to happen, at least not this year. So uh, what would be a good outcome coming out of the elections? Do you think, would you like to see the Democrats win, bad as they are, or um, uh, the, 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 the Trump, the MAGA Republicans, uh, co continue their takeover of this system, which I think would be a disaster. And I think it's largely actually going to be up to the women because they've been affected by what's going on. I mean, like they say, if, if uh, men got pregnant, then abortion would be a sacred ritual. Uh, because I know, uh, I used to ask my students, you know, um, you know, if you thought you might get pregnant having sex with a woman, would you have sex with them? And I think they were just horrified by that. And I stopped asking that because they you know, really found this whole idea so shocking. So I just want to make those points. And again, we have a healthy discussion here and I really appreciate your bringing out these views. But um, I think uh, the question is, okay, well, what would be a good outcome of uh, uh, the coming elections? Thank you. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how the electoral system works around the issue of abortion rights. Because I, I think that's very instructive, and I think it's instructive of the, why the we frame the question as the two-party system and not just which party is the lesser of the two evils. Because the Democratic Party very much understands how that works. And the Democratic Party has consistently used that because they understand that the people who support abortion rights have no place else to go. They're a captured constituency, and therefore they can take them for granted. And that is why Hillary Clinton, when she ran for president, chose a pro-life vice president running mate. Because they, she knew that People like Jean would not would still vote and settle for the Democrats, even though they brought in a pro-life person as a person who's a heartbeat away from the presidency. We saw that with Obama. And, um, the, he had ran when, when Obama first ran for the presidency. He pledged repeatedly that the first thing he would do was codify Roe. That was his main running point. The day he, and he said that it was the first thing he would do when he became the president. And he never did. Because the abortion rights issue is too good an issue for the Democrats to squander by supporting abortion rights. It's better to use the boogeyman of the other side. Right now, there's a guy named Henry Sular He's a, a, a Democratic congressperson from Texas who's running on a pro-life ticket. The Democratic Party is going all out in supporting him. Um, Joe Biden, we have to remember, um, his comment on Roe was, quote, Roe went too far. And he, Joe Biden, supported a constitutional amendment to overturn Roe. And he said, quote, um, he did not think that a woman has the sole right to say what should happen to her body. So when you tell me that our only choice is between voting for the lesser of the, of the two evils, I'm saying that has not gotten us abortion rights. In fact, it has gotten us just the opposite. 
the abrogation of abortion rights. Uh, Alan, do you, do you want to add anything to that? No. Can I just quickly say, I never said the only choice is to vote for Republicans. I say it's a better than to let the uh, um, yeah. Republicans take control of both houses and uh, horrifying to get Trump back in office. I think that would be even worse. And uh, you didn't respond to, is there a good outcome? Or, or, or what do you think people should do this November? Um, uh, so and, anyway. Okay. Yes, let I me, think let me, let me go ahead, the Democrats Richard, let me go ahead and comment. <laughs> let no, me go make ahead. a quick comment. Go on. Okay. So I think, Gene, I think what you're really putting forward is exactly the, the lesser evil line that our presentation is polemicizing against. And the idea here is that what we're going to do is we're going to say to people, look, Trump is horrible. If you're going to support if you're not going to support the Democrats, we're going to have something horrible that's happening. And I think that what 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 you're doing is really diverting attention from what the nature of the problem is. The problem is not that Trump is terrible. The problem is that the current political system is not addressing the distress and the problems that people are facing, both the Democrats and the Republicans. And if we continue to support politics that does not address the problems that people are facing, if we don't expose both of the parties, their role, and the state of the capitalist system and how the capitalist system is engendering these problems, then what we're going to do is we're going to pour gasoline on the fire. We're going to feed the growth of the right. So I think that your perspective is, in fact, while the idea is that it's going to stem the tide of fascism, what it's actually going to do is fan the flames of fascism. And we can already see that happening. We can already see that happening. We even have, we have working class voters. We even have minority voters, Latino voters, Black voters, are moving over to the Republican Party precisely because the Democrats are not putting forward anything that's solving their problems. So the idea is, yeah, right now we don't have the power to put into place the solution, but we've got to start walking down that road and not walking down this other road that's leading us to disaster. So I wanted to address that specifically. Okay, been walking down that road for many, many years. But anyway, okay. I'll, I'll put myself uh, on the stack. Um, go ahead, Richard. Right. And uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the discussion. <laughs> um, I wanted to raise uh, an, another question that hasn't been really raised yet, and, but I think is important. Um, and as Gene said, you know, we've been hearing these same, these same discussions for basically since the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, in my perspective, I believe that what we're seeing is a, is a return to the, 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 the dilemma uh, of the Vietnam War and, and its lack of resolution. Part of that, it seems to me, is, is, uh, is on the left. Um, I see. I see a lot of uh, a lot of activity in the in the in the peace and freedom groups. Uh, they get out and they they uh, they demonstrate. You know, they have 10, 15, maybe twenty people to get together, and then they go home. And what I don't see happening is I don't see them getting out and and organizing. Uh, yeah, back to my old my old dilemma here. How you know how do we how do we address address this 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 problem they they don't get out and they i mean basically they amount to talking amongst themselves and they don't get out one in, certainly in, in the city and and address other people and more to the point they don't they they're you know uh uh they're totally leaving out the rural areas uh so they're you know so it's basically uh a, a lot of inbreeding if you will 
and I, I believe it's 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 really hurting us because they uh, they're becoming ineffective, uh, and that is that that is a part of the petitioning of the government that we're really talking about here is 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 the is the uh, the uh, the third or fourth or fifth estate however you want to talk about them they need to I, and i've been part of these groups i mean i've been out there you know uh you know against iraq or against uh, the invasion of uh iraq against any number of these things um uh and, and it seems ineffective uh so could you maybe address, you know, uh, what the what what the peace and justice can do to address these the, that that issue? Thank you. Any comment from uh, our speakers? Okay. Hearing none, we'll go on to the next speaker, Janet Coburn. Hi. Thank you for this uh, discussion. Um, so. To me, the two-party system is political theater to maintain the status quo behind the curtain. Um, so I mean, a few things. Uh, the Supreme Court is taking away our long fought for rights. Um, and what is the, what are the Democrats doing about it? You know, so there has been a call to expand the number they're not going to do it or they're there um so that's it it remains the status quo um i wanted to uh also talk about uh biden's september 1st battle for the soul of the nation speech which i listened to the whole thing thank you for playing that little clip uh but uh, to me, he, he denigra denigrated the MAGA people uh, by calling 75 million, uh, uh, million uh, people who voted for Trump, quote, enemies of the United States. He used that phrase, which is very similar to the deplorables that Hillary Clinton used. Um, and so what does that do? That's that's really very divisive and provocative. And it's it, it just gonna rile up the Republic or you know the MAGAs, and maybe they'll get more votes because of that. I mean, so it's like this this game, this theater thing. And it's terrible for the for in reality, what you know, it's dangerous. But now I don't support Trump or Biden, um, and I voted for Howie Hawkins for president in 2020. It was a, 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 a I, I went through this, uh, it took me about, I don't know how long, 10 minutes, I was staring at my ballot, you know, am I gonna vote for Biden just so that Trump won't, wouldn't get reelected? Um, and I just could not vote for Biden. I mean, he's a war criminal in my opinion. I couldn't vote for, for or you know, the lesser of two evils. I couldn't vote for evil, period. So I just decided to vote for Howie Hawkins. But now Howie Hawkins has a terrible position on Ukraine. He goes along with the two party narrative. Ah, so what about that in any case? Um, and what to do about the, the two-party system we can complain about and all that. I'm wondering what percent of American workers identify as working class? I mean, there's jargon in uh, uh, socialist jargon uh, like working class. I think only a small percentage of American workers identify with socialist jargon and maybe you know, the language that's used needs to change because the jargon is a turnoff for, for many people. They, they don't either understand it or they associate it with things that, you know, with the, with the, like authoritarianism. I'll stop there. Um, any any um, comment from our speakers? 
Okay, we'll go on. Wait, so wait, we, let's, uh, Roger, wait did you have any comment? Yeah, I have a let's comment. Let's hold on. Hello? No, wait, wait, Nina, Nina, Nina. We need to, we're, we're doing this in order. Ro Roger, did you want to make a quick comment in response to Janet? You're, you're muted, Roger. Quick comment about Holly Hawkins and um, the Green Party. Um, it's a third party, and I, I think, you know, what we need is a second party. <laughs> we have one party of capital, and we need a second party. Um, the Green Party um, provides an alternative. Um, but if you wanted to vote for the Green Party today in New York State, you probably would not be able to, because the Democrats have up the requirements for third parties to remain on the ballot, and they've effectively removed the Green Party from Howard Hawkins' home state. That, that's all I wanted to comment on. Yeah, okay. I, I wanted to make a quick comment on uh, Janet's uh, comment and question. First of all, I just, I really want to agree with you, Janet. I think we can't underestimate the importance of the danger of targeting the MAGA Republicans in, in the same way that the, the deplorables targeting that Hillary Clinton did in 2016 drove people away and, and towards uh, Trump. And I also want to agree with what Janet was saying as far as the theatrics of, of the election system. And that's really what's taking place today. We have these culture wars. We have the dog whistles on the Republican right against immigrants and uh, minorities. And then on the Democrats, we have a lot of this kind of woke uh, rhetoric and theatrics like the, the Kinta cloth donning of Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats in the Congress, you know, and the January uh, to, six, to sort the of January, virtue signal. And the January 6th hearings. Yeah, so I think your points are at the heart of what this question is, and it's exactly the point that we have to try to point out to people. What are the problems that we're facing? And I gave a long list of those problems. Why are they why are they taking place today? I think this is really, really important. This is the path that we should be taking. And we should be talking about, we should be talking about socialism uh, as a solution. And I agree with Mike that we we need to take the the bull by the horns. Roger talked about this too, the bull by the horns, and talk about the nature of, of socialism in the in the past historically. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and say something. Um, in the in the uh, in the June primary, I um, I supported a, a young businessman, um, petty bourgeois businessman, against the warmongering uh, Congress. Congressman in my congresswoman in my congressional district, namely Bob Lee. Unfortunately, he didn't make any kind of breakthrough, but basically because of his weak organization and his weak platform. Um, Lenin said, Lenin insisted, even under the um, under the autocracy of of the, um, the czar, that it was important to to engage in electoral struggles at certain points, and even to participate in uh, bourgeois legislatures. Um, I wonder if anybody has any information about sort of spontaneous uh, struggles against the two-party systems that are making any progress or look promising in, in, um, in the United States at this time. Um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, um, let me let me say a few words, Roger. I, do you want to go ahead, or should I? Uh... Let me follow, please. Okay. All right. Let me make. A, a, I think you're making some really interesting points. Um, 
first of all, I think I think what Gene was saying earlier, I would agree that the the Sanders movement is really an indication of the potential and the opportunity for the left in the US today. And the point is that we have to grab that opportunity. So I think, Gene, you're right on that point. But the idea is that we have to grab the opportunity. And by putting forward our perspective, which is not the perspective of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but a progressive anti-capitalist perspective, a pro-socialist perspective. Um, I want to mention something. I don't know how many of you are aware of right now there's this kind of subculture on the internet of uh, YouTube presenters and people on Twitter and social media. And there's a real growing, a bubbling up at the base, especially among young people of anti-capitalist, anti-capitalist party positions. So there's a comedian in the US, Jimmy Dore, who does program after program he mainly criticizes the Democratic Party, but he also criticizes the Republican Party, the ineptitude and the corruption of the, the two-party system. He has over a million, almost a million and a quarter followers now. And his, his presentations on YouTube are garnering, garnering tens of thousands of people who watch them. There are Marxist YouTube channels, young people, who are putting forward ideas. We've had some of them on our at, speak at our uh, Sunday morning sessions who are putting forward Marxist ideas and ideas of socialism. There's a little bit of unclarity in my view right now. There's a little bit of a sort of a swing to libertarianism and right populism. But that being said, I don't think that we should underestimate the significance of, of this sort of stuff that's taking place. And so I'm saying, Richard, we're not right now we don't have like a massive mass movement uh, on the working class and on the left but i think that there are lots of signs of uh potential that are there yeah and and, and i um very much agree with what alan said and also what richard you you said i think it's important to realize that both lenin and marx as you pointed out have said that it's important to engage in the electoral struggle um, they endorsed that type of activity. They also added the caveat that that engagement should always be independent of the capitalist class, that it should be a workers' um, electoral movement. Um, and the in independence was very, very important in both the writings of Lenin and Marx, as you pointed out. Um, in and I also agree with what Alan, Alan was saying that the, the Sanders movement was really quite quite remarkable. I mean, this was a grassroots movement. Um, Sanders had no support within the Democratic Party. In fact, quite the opposite. The Democratic Party did everything they could to undermine him, and and in in the end, they they were successful in undermining him. Um, it was a self funded movement, and it was um, it did have um a, a potential that that bordered on revolutionary potential where it failed and where i think we have to see the importance of the lesson of the burning movement is that it became captured by the democratic party um and and that is the, the graveyard of, of social movements um so i i think that the, on one hand Sanders showed that there really was a basis for a grassroots movement, but the grassroots movement really needs to be independent. And that, that's both, um, I'll, I'll stop there. Fine. Hey, Thank can I say something? Yes, go ahead, Nina. I'm sorry, but I've had my hand up for uh, about yes, you're, you're 20 next. minutes. Okay, so I had a question for Norman. Um, uh, do you believe in democracy? Who, who you question for who? Norman. Does he believe in democracy? Norman who? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, what? <laughs> I got his name wrong. Well, Who's the well, on the... Is that, is, that, is that your statement, Nina? No, do you believe in democracy? Nina, I was just don't. asking. 
Okay. The, the question okay, is. If that person wants to respond, thank you, no. Nina. If that hey. person wants to respond, we'll go. Okay. Uh, the fellow who's in okay. the, the, the task force on the Americas, all right, that'll that'll distinguish him. Does he believe Roger. in democracy? Roger. Richard, yeah, Roger. the third Richard. All right, does he believe in democracy? Roger. Roger, yeah, does Roger believe in democracy? Well, if he... Could, could I get an answer? Uh, do you want to finish your, your comment or, or, or do you want to have it back and forth? Because I think... No, all I want to know here. is, do you believe in democracy? Uh, that's all you want to know? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, there seems to be. Then, 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 uh, but you said you didn't want to have a back and forth, so let's go on to the next speaker. No, no, I, I do in this sense. I no, just I don't want to, say, want to have a back and forth on this. Well, okay. I just want to say that that's Nina, a contradiction. Nina, Nina, no, Nina. absolutely. If you want to speak, okay, okay. And thank you. We're moving on. Sharon, Rose. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just have a couple of comments. Um, I, I um, don't agree with what Roger put out about the insurrection and how the people just went home and it was the Democrats that kept things going and actually fed their what what the insurrectionists um, or the the Republicans were doing. They went home, but in a lot of cases they're organizing on a local level. They are showing up at school board meetings, passing resolutions to um, ban books in schools, and um, doing a lot of other stuff on a local level that is that um, is essentially fascist. So I think you're right. I mean, I, I just, I, I agree with you when you point out that it's the Democrats who are funding uh, some of these ultra right candidates and in the hope that they'll get to be the lesser, the Democrats will get to be the lesser of two evils. I agree. I agree with that. And I also agree with a lot of other things that both of you had to say, but I just wanted to point out that thing about we need to look at local politics across the country. Um, so on the question of what is to be done, um, I, yesterday I watched the first half of a conference put on by the Communist Party USA um, entitled uh, Defeating Imperialism in the 21st Century. And it's an international conference. And it, I'm missing the second half today, but it's gonna both of the, all of it's gonna be on YouTube. Um, and today our friend Gerald Horn is speaking there. And what was, I, I learned a number of different things there, um, but one of the most important was that the Communist Party is um, in favor of communist, of their members running for office. And they're encouraging their members to look at how they can run for various offices. Um, across the country. Now, I don't know whether that means that the Com Communist Party intends to run someone for president after the years of not doing that, but there was definitely a, a sense from one of the chair people of the, one of the co-chairs who spoke of the party who spoke that, that they are self-critical, that they have not, that they've given up on running candidates for a long time and they're going to correct that, which I applaud because I've thought it was a mistake all along. Um, and I think that it's important to talk about how we can run non-Democrat Republicans um, in all kinds of different races. It's much harder than it used to be. Um, I think somebody mentioned about New York, one of you mentioned about New York, and it's true a, a, around the country that it's certainly more, more difficult in California to get third parties, at least at the state level, on the ballot. Um, but we should still, I think, not give up on electoral politics as, um, as one vehicle of uh, raising the, the um, 
importance of, of socialism, of the struggle for socialism. Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you, Sharon. I really appreciate those comments. Um, I, I, I didn't want to imply that local struggles were, were not, not important. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think th there is some really, um, you, know, you know, scary things happening at, at the local level um, that, that need to be addressed. Alan, do, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to comment a little bit on um, Sharon's, the first uh, point that she talked about. And I'd like to make a very careful point about the January 6th um, demonstrations, the insurrection that took place and how it's playing out politically. And um, I, I agree with you, Sharon, that we should not underestimate the danger that's there on the part of sort of this right-wing populism and the, the election nullification and the election denial that's taking place. But I'd like to make a couple of points on that specifically. Number one, I do believe that the Democratic Party is opportunistically using those events distorting their nature and, and significance of those events to put in an extremely dangerous set of laws and an ideological campaign against the January 6th movement that poses great dangers for the left and the American people. And the, just to kind of spell this out a little bit more, what the, what, the, what the Democrats have done in their January 6th production and sort of making this the, the heart of what is uh, threatening our democracy, keep in mind that the Democrats are waging an anti-insurrection campaign. They've supported the expansion of Capitol Police powers, the uh, we now have an office in San Francisco of the Washington DC Cap uh, Capitol Police. And basically this campaign against the January 6th demonstrations is being used to prepare the ground ideologically to sort of sow the seeds of anti-insurrection politics and ideology. And my, my question to people or what I would pose to people is, what if those were people who were suffering from the COVID lockdown, unemployment and inflation, were marching on the Capitol building and broke in and took it over and sat in Nancy Pelosi's chair, would we be decrying sort of their lawlessness and the fact that they're breaking the law? Well, I don't think so. I think that that's the kind of thing that we would like to see, just like the veterans marches of the 1930s and a lot of those grassroots things that happened during the Vietnam War and the civil rights, the black liberation movement of the 1960s. So there's, there's this whole other side of this that, that's uh, taking place in response to the gender. The, the Democrats are using it opportunistically. And I think that what we need to really uh, do is sort of get away from that and talk about both parties promoting election nullification. It's not just the Democrats, but it's the Republicans too. And in doing so, talk about the degeneration of the political system. And they're not addressing our problems. So oh, okay. anyway, that's, that's my response. Thank you. Um, uh, next speaker is Norma, followed by Kit, then Raj and Jean. Norma. Good. Uh, just to follow behind what Sharon was talking about candidacy uh, campaigns and the inaccessibility to have ballot access, uh, we can, maybe somebody can talk about this. Maybe Sharon has an impression about it. Uh, we need to run locally. Uh, you know, I run a preposterous campaign for Board of Education, uh, uh, speaking of communism and its values. 
Um, but uh, other people could run for local offices, at least to begin some insurrectionary behavior uh, 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 about which people could begin to uh, organize their activities. That um, if people are speaking in large numbers, even at the so-called bottom or deplorable level, whatever, if we were saying our issues out there on the ballot, uh, which we can access uh, much differently from uh, the way we access uh, for, uh, seats for assembly and you know the statewide uh, and national positions, at least we'd be having some not only uh, ability to get on a ballot and talk, but uh, an ability to clarify any opportunity we can derive from that kind of activity, that kind of activism. Okay, thank you. Next, Kit. Hello, hi. Hello. Uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of discussion about the vast majority of working class and versus the bourgeoisie, which I think is probably around 10% of the country. Uh, I think we also need to address the state and role of the petty bourgeois, which is a huge number of people in this country. Um, I don't remember the exact statistic, but somewhere either 60% or 40% of jobs are created by small business companies or business people. Uh, either way, that's a huge number, and they're involved in creating jobs. We have a lot of small business people who are caught in the middle uh, between the parties, but who may seem to lean towards the right in order to protect their positioning. I know they are a shrinking class, but they are a significant group, and the left needs to learn how to address that. Uh, they all seem to, not all, but many seem to ignore the petty bourgeois and dismiss them and, and how to deal with uh, their issues. Um, so anyway, can you please address that? Thank you. You yeah, are um, Alan, can you do that? Alan? Uh, you know, Kid, I think that that's a really good point. Um, I think that addressing the small business, which really there was an, a small business apocalypse during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, and uh, the unsupported lockdowns and things like that. So I, I agree with you that any realistic program on the part of the left in the US has to take into account the interests of uh, small businesses. I'm not sure how I would formulate that programmatically, but I do think that it's going to have to be uh, a set of measures that are going to uh, support small businesses on the one hand, and then the other hand, try and split people off from a uh, uniting with the uh, the large, you know, the the big capital in this country. So I'm not really sure uh, how that would be done, but I agree that it's a it's an important point. Carrying on, we're now sort of in the second round. Uh, Raj, followed by Gene, followed by Richard Wright. Okay, so what Kit said uh, about that is uh, job generation by petty bourgeois. Uh, in petty bourgeois class in the United States, last time I looked in the last two, three years, it comprises about 25% of the population. That means children included of the petty bourgeois. So it's a very significant group. Uh, but one problem, you talk about identity politics, one of the problem is, and that's where Janet raised a very important question, do the American working classes enable, except for now what I was called the proletarians of American society, which is the fast food workers and so forth, you know, they are uh, actually in a mindset that they are petty bourgeois, okay? So they identify with them. I mean, the bulk of the American working class, when I came here, I was surprised to hear they, they consider themselves living in democracy 
and they said, what capitalism? So uh, what has happened is this happened to England, the imperialist uh, bribe is the issue I raised. And now it's imperialist bribe is basically reduced, uh, but the lower half of the population has swung over to, to the right wing. And the question is, how can, this is the group that will fight, you know, MAGA, MAGA supporters, they are willing to fight for, because they have suffered. I mean, they suffered the privileged position they had, now they become underprivileged in society. So left question would be how to bring them. And I think uh, if those of you who have watched this comedian in Chicago, Jimmy Dore, he had a program where a, a socialist is talking to a mega worker and they're both agreeing on almost everything. So they're agreeing that the system is ripping them off. So as long as we accept the system as legitimate and try to find accommodation and kind of left accommodation, I think it's not going to work. We have to have a radical position that the whole system has to be overthrown. Now in that regard, I just want to ask Gandhi used the boycott of a uh, uh, British boycott very successfully and it made them illegitimate. And so the question is, how can this system be boycotted without bringing in uh, right-wingers in power? And if somebody can devise a way to say, look, this is not working for three quarters of the people. So why don't we junk this system and do something else. And the question is how you formulate so people don't see, oh my God, uh, all the prejudices they have against Stalin and Mao and all that, which has been drilled into their heads, doesn't become a fact. So any thoughts on that, Alan and, and Roger in particular, but for that, beyond that, anybody else? Thank you. Okay, <laughs> a couple of uh, a, a quick, uh... Uh, points. Um, first of all, I think that Raj, what you're touching on is sort of the biggest question of the historic period that we're in and the transition out of the post-war period, which is the demise of the, the old liberal order. So in the post-war period, in particular in the 50s and 60s, because of the dominant position of American capitalism in the world capitalist system, the dollar being the reserve currency, they were able to, and dominating international trade and production while Europe was ruined and Asia was ruined, they were able to throw scraps at the working class, put in a kind of a legal structure that sort of contained the class struggle, the union system in the US, build up a political constituency uh, consisting of reformist politicians and uh, a trade union leadership that's very much tied into the system. And that's what we have today. Now, I don't think the working class ever really had a, a deep stake, stake in the capital system. I think most workers were proletarians who earned their livelihood on the basis of their labor and were always insecure and always barely surviving. But there was a kind of a blunting of the class struggle that, that was taking place during that period. What's happening today is that this system of domination of the Western imperialist powers is disintegrating, it's declining, it's being challenged by the rise of Russia, China, India, the BRICS, BRICS countries. And you know something that, that Mike brought up very early that I wanna point out is that a lot of the deficit spending and the indebtedness of, of the US today, what makes it possible for them to continue this as well as their, their worldwide military empire and just sort of throwing tens of billions of dollars at, at uh, Ukraine on a daily basis is the position of the dollar in the international financial system. And the fact that the Chinese, the Japanese, and other countries were funneling dollars back by buying treasury bonds to finance American government spending, that this system is getting shakier and shakier. And the, 
the Ukraine war is really what's driving this. And I, I would say that this system, its days are numbered. And when the dollar loses its ability to finance on the ba basis of just issuing paper debt, both the social welfare system as, as tattered as it is, and this international military and uh, foreign aid system, you're gonna see a, a sharpening of the class struggle. We're already seeing it in a sense in Europe taking place right now. We're gonna see this, the upcoming period, we're gonna see a sharpening of the class struggle like we've never seen in the post-war period. The United States has been running balance of payments, balance of trade deficits since the 1980s, balance of payments deficits for years and years and years. They can only do this on the basis of the dollar. The Ukraine situation is undermining that right now. And I think that what we're gonna see is a reassertion of the class struggle and the ability of the capitalist class to use the mechanisms that they had available in the immediate post-war period are not gonna be there for them to, to, to use. Now, that doesn't mean we're automatically gonna have a left-wing movement for socialism. Fascism, I think, is a big threat right now, perhaps even a bigger threat, because there is the left has been so decimated. But these are objective conditions that are going to give rise to the growth. And I, I don't think we should also, we talk about third parties, but we shouldn't diminish the importance of communist parties and communist politics, where, you know, I think that it's that let's not lose sight of the importance of that and our need to put our attention to that. And that's kind of what we're doing here today. We're talking about a lot of these issues. And Jean and then Richard Wright, followed by, by Janet and Norma. Go ahead, Jean. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Jean. I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, <coughs> appreciate all these comments and I think there have been some questionable um, facts put forth. One is, uh, I, I didn't listen to Biden's speech, but I did read it. Uh, and as I interpret it, he didn't say all Republicans are deplorable or even everybody that voted for Trump is deplorable, but he did attack Trump at Trump himself as and the MAGA Republicans as a threat to uh, uh, bourgeois democracy. We didn't use the term bourgeois democracy. but So that's one point. Secondly, the January 6th insurrection was not just an insurrection of a bunch of, you know, peaceniks out there, you know, wanted to protest the government. They were violent. You know, they wanted to kill Nancy Pelosi, uh, Mike Pence, and so forth. And irrespective of, you know, what we might think about that ideologically, you know, you know, that was violent insurrection. Uh, and that's against the law and punishing people like the Proud Boys, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to kill people. Um, that makes more sense. But the larger thing, larger misconception, I think, is that globally socialism is on the retreat. It's true that U.S. imperialism is on the retreat, but the expansion of China um, in terms of the things that China has done, this is China socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. And we are in a new era where the socialist China can stand up to US imperialism and defeat it, which it's doing. I mean, if you look at uh, South America, for example, the Belt and Road uh, uh, um, uh, initiative, you know, has like 20 countries in Latin America that have, uh, 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 signed on to this program. And Xi Jinping, you know, and the Communist Party of China, Chinese Communist Party of China, um, it, you know, they've raised 800 million people out of, lot, out of poverty, which is very significant. And it's only uh, equaled by the Soviet experience under Stalin, where they transformed society in an equally important way. So I think uh, globally, socialism on the, is on the rise globally, and that socialism is socialism with Chinese characteristics. Um, and uh, we, we see that, 
you know, with the war in, Viet in, in Ukraine, Xi Jinping and uh, uh, Vladimir Putin are best friends. And as I've always said, any friend of Xi Jinping is a friend of mine. So I will uh, leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, next, next one. Is wait, wait, can we get some comments on that? Yes, go ahead. Roger, Roger, did you? Okay, I wanna make a couple of quick comments. First of all, I really wanna disagree with you. I did watch the speech and I think that that what Biden did was he kind of walked back his targeting of of the MAGAs by saying, well, it's not all Republicans. It's like, you know, we have Lindsey Graham and and uh, Liz Cheney and people like that who don't support this this Trump phenomenon. And I think that that's I think for us not to to sort of run interference for Biden by by saying, well, he's not targeting MAGA. I think MAGA Republicans, people who who are looking to the Republican Party, which, as Janet pointed out, 74 million people who voted for Trump, they took it as an attack on them. And I think that what we need to do is say that this is not the not the road that we want to go down. We want to address the problems that people that are driving people to support Trump and to say it's not it's not you know these white workers working in gas stations whose kids are hooked on drugs and opiates that are the problem but it's the capitalist class the democratic party big tech financial people the oil companies supported by the republican party we want to target them and we don't want to let uh, biden off the hook on that so that's that's what i would say I have some things to say about socialism, but I've said enough right okay. now. I'll come I just back want to, to say that. those 74 million yeah. people that voted for Trump were not necessarily voting for Trump as against Hillary Clinton. So uh, that's, I, I that's exactly that. right. And that's why we shouldn't we shouldn't support Biden in uh, in uh, attacking the MAGA Republicans. No, not good. Just paying to settle for Biden. That's all this just for November, just for November. Um, next is Richard. Right. Um, I got to say, I watched about the first five or 10 minutes of, uh, of Tail Gunner Joe's speech, and uh, um, I couldn't take it anymore. I went to go puke or something. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, yesterday, Nan and I had this conversation. Um, uh, we were talking about uh, Mao's. Uh, 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 Mao's contribution to, uh, to revolution, if you will, um, and um, and what she mentioned and she brought home was the fact that, I mean, it wasn't just a simple matter of 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 uh, radicalizing the peasants. Uh, that what happened was uh, that, that when he got in the countryside, he realized that the peasants would would. Uh, would be would fight on his side, but as soon as they won, they as soon as they won, uh, they, what was in their interest, they would ab abort the, uh, the the struggle, the big, the biggest struggle, and that um, and that and that his solution to this was uh, to form organizing committees, if you will, uh, in the rural areas uh, to form a. Uh, uh, um, as she said, it was like five or six people that would uh, that would bring the revolution down back to the peasants and help keep them in line, if you will. Um, it's the same sort of problem, I think, that that, um, uh, that faced uh, 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 Lenin and, and Stalin in particular um, uh, in the Soviet Union uh, or the ex-Soviet Union. Um, and I thought that she had a good point in that once again, that we are not, we are, you know, we are, we are restricting ourselves to the industrial areas and that we need to get into the rural areas where there's, where, where the, where the quote MAGA Republicans have their hold in particular through the churches um, and, and, um, and take a lesson from Mao in that respect. So not, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just pass it on. Thank you. Bye. Um, any response from uh, uh, Okay. 
Moving on, Janet Colburn and then Norma and me. Okay, so uh, first I, I'll uh, address Gene. Um, in, in his speech, Biden called those who voted for Trump, quote, the enemies of the United States. He said it, he said those words. Uh, and by the way- Are you I, saying he said quote? No, not without the quotes, okay. with quote words. Okay. Um, and I posted a link to the speech on, on the chat, so you can hear it yourself. I know, I, I don't remember where it was in the speech, uh, and it wasn't that long a speech. In any case, and I, it, I, I was horrified when I was listening to it. Um, Raj, um, so I think you said something like 25% of the working class associate as petty bourgeoisie. No, I said 25% of the population of the United States is part of petty bourgeois class. That class. includes okay. children of the petty bourgeois class. Yeah. Okay. One out of four. Yeah. One out of four. Okay. So even, even that phrase, I mean, earlier I, I was talking about how I, to me, yeah, I, I, I might be wrong, but it's just my impression that the American working class does not identify as working class. I mean, would you ask uh, just an individual on the street who or in a who works in a store or whatever? Do you? you know, I mean, yeah, that's I agree. Do you, do I agree you identify as working class, and it's like, what? What do you mean working class? What do you mean by that? Um, and um, in any case, I. I the the whole uh, so the socialist jargon I was referring to, like using the term bourgeois, bourgeois petty bourgeoisie, uh, proletarian, those kinds of terms. I, I think is it. I don't know whether those of you who organize with, you know, use those terms with people to try to recruit people. Uh, if you do, I think it, it, it's a turnoff. And um, if if it could, the the principles of, can be reworded in more uh, familiar um, jargon, it, it, it would be better. I mean, I think one of the attractions of Bernie Sanders was that he he was able to do that. Um, but I mean, I, his idea of socialism in my opinion is very limited. Um, I'd, I'd really like to hear from Laura I mean, uh, on, on uh, the two-party system, yeah. if she would okay. be willing to contribute. I'm done. Okay. Uh, our next... Well, before we go on, uh, uh, let yeah, me go a few comments. So, yeah, Janet, um, I, I, I I did look up the the speech uh, that Biden made the saving the souls of the nation speech. Um, nowhere in that speech is the word enemy used. Um, th th that speech was you know the, the best speech writers that money could buy put those words up on the teleprompter for him. Uh, so they were careful in their wording but but this is what he did, did say you, did you hear it or did you read read a transcript i'm reading a transcript including right, they the, might have they might have removed that i'm going to listen again to oh, see. okay yeah it's possible that okay. the, that the I, I actually listened several times he did yeah. he really say that anyway but, yeah so so that, that'll be a factual question that we want to get get um determined. What he did say is MAGA forces are determined to take the country backwards. They promote authoritarian leaders. They fan the flames of political violence that is a threat to our personal rights and to the pursuit of justice, to the rule of law, and to the very soul of this country. So the, this is a really fire and brimstone um, speech. And then he went on to say, I believe America is at an inflection point one of those moments that determine the shape of everything that's, that comes after. And I think that part we could agree with. It's just which direction that inflection is going to be at. Um, 
but he did say some things that were just blatantly um, needed to be responded to. He says, um, um, this is a nation that respects free and fair elections. Now, this has not been the policy of, the, of either party internationally. We only respect elections where the candidates that win are the ones that are on our sides. The, the United States has only re respected one election in Venezuela since 19, um, 2013, and that was the one election when the opposition won the National Assembly. All the other elections, they considered illegitimate. In fact, the United States recognizes a man by the name of Juan Guaido, a former deputy in the Venezuelan National Assembly who declared himself president as a legitimate president of Venezuela. This is not true that we, this is a nation that respects free and fair elections. We do not respect the elections of Nicaragua, where 70, um, 70, 64 percent of the, of the electorate um, participated in the last national election. That's a very high percentage, especially compared to the United States and Mr. Biden's election. And 75% of that electorate, or 76%, I'm not sure which of those two numbers are right, voted for the winning candidate, Daniel Ortega. Um, it, um, Biden goes on to, to say, this is a vision that rejects violence as a political tool. I mean, let's get real. The largest military power in the world, the one that has upwards of 800, maybe 900, maybe 1,000 foreign military bases, uh, spends more of a percentage of its, of its national uh, GDP on military than any other country, a country that, um, whose military spending is greater than the next 10 countries' military spendings. It, we, uh, for, for the leader of the, the CEO of the capitalist class to say, this is a nation that rejects violence as a political tool is, is an outright lie. He says, I want to say this plain and simple. There is no place for political violence in, this, in, this state, in, in America, but we have a security state. We have, have a deep, we have the CIA, the N NSA, the uh, FBI. Um, the, the, the speech is just full of lies. Um, he said, um, and, 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 and not only lies, but, but, but things that are just absolutely absurd. I mean, this is a direct quote from the speech. We are going to end cancer as we know it. I'll just end there. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, can I make a quick comment to, in response to Janet? Uh, Janet, I think your point about using terms like bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie is very well taken. This is a Marxist forum and we're kind of, we'll, we'll throw around that sort of terminology, but I think you're right in the, in a broader uh, mass uh, setting that it, we have to be careful about that kind of thing. That being said, I don't think we should shy away from politically talking about capitalism, trying to bring a sense of what imperialism is to people. And I think right now on the left, there's a little bit of a tilting towards libertarianism and right populism. And I think people on the left can really play an important role in quote unquote, educating people about these sort of things. Uh, the second point that you made that I think uh, I'd like to address is, you know, did Biden uh, target the MAGAs? You know, I talked to a lot of my friends. Most of my friends, frankly, are little liberal people, kind of working class professionals, middle class people. And that, that's how they look at things. You know, that a lot of these people really look at these MAGA people as these are ignorant people. These are the deplorables. These are the, the scum of the earth. They're, they're all racist. And I think that this is exactly what Biden and the Democrats are playing on. And in doing so, what's happening is that the people at, at the other end of that look at it and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, I'm sitting here working in a gas station at minimum wage. My kids are on opiates. I have no future. And you're telling me that, that I'm living a life of privilege and uh, 
um, that I'm the target of your politics. Well, hey, I'm going over to Donald Trump. Hey, I'm going over to the people who are the right of Donald Trump because I'm really radicalized. So I think this idea that Biden and the Democrats aren't targeting the MAGAs and fanning the flames of this sort of division is a very dangerous idea. There's no, there's no, nothing to it on, um, in reality. Go ahead. Okay, well, we're almost to the end of our recorded session. So the last speaker will be Norma Harrison. And then what about Laura? Yeah. She hasn't no. spoken. Laura no, has they're gonna, no, they're gonna continue yeah. on, you know, after the- Then, then we'll open, then we'll open this. Oh uh, yeah, Laura just put her hand up. I guess I should give Laura a chance to speak. She, she hasn't spoken. Uh, go ahead, Laura. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay. Oh, where'd I go? <laughs> um, I don't, boy, don't we all wish we had some answers for why, you know, things are as bad as they are and people are lining up the way they're lining up. Um, and so I don't have much to say. It's just that it's so disconcerting to me how many people are focused on Trump. You know, progressive, not necessarily political people and stuff like that, but they're still hooked on Trump. And so, you know, the fact that Biden uh, went there, so many people are receptive. They're just Trump, Trump, Trump. They think that's what's what went wrong. And Joe's a good Joe and stuff like that. They have no idea how bad that guy is. But it's just even here in, um, in California politics. I mean, look at Gavin Newsom. Look at the decisions that he's making. Look at Jerry Brown. People have no idea how vile the things that Jerry Brown did. And so, I mean, that's all, you know, just the focus on Trump and the Democrats have a, long history of looking for good excuses and they can and people will buy those excuses and i think that's primarily because we want to buy our own excuses we want to have a good excuse you know like can we did we get that done did we do that did we succeed here did we no but we have a damn good excuse and trump is like the good excuse of the united states of america so that's thank you thank you very much that's the the, the final word, uh, very eloquent. Um, we'll turn off the uh, recording now, and uh, we'll go four, on to. A... You got four minutes till twelve thirty. No, I I have twelve. Well, that's true. So maybe Norma <laughs> is the fast speaker. Go ahead, Norma. I, uh, understand that I'm not the last speaker. People will carry on afterward. What that split is, I have no idea. Uh, they, they do it every time. Anyway, um, uh, we need to, well, maybe you can explain it to me sometime, Sharon. Um, we need to be able to talk about that begging for a job is not a progressive uh, action on the part of whoever telling people jobs, jobs, is not a progressive, we, we have to teach people that it is us on our knees instead of saying, oh, we need to get jobs as though that's really an answer. Yes, we need jobs in order to be able to have dinner, but that's not the goal of our struggle in any way. We're trying to build a society where we provide it for us all and comfort and and in pleasure and and not for profit of by our owners which goes along to a degree uh with the comment uh, uh raj was uh uh asked uh, or commenting is something uh, hold on i forget it uh calling the working class uh, the working class was said to be 25% of the people, and Raj wanted to ask if that meant and referred to all those professionals. And I wanted to know if he wants a distinction among 
the people that have to go at work at a job that uh, inevitably makes profit for our owners. Is there another word or another well, phrase? Yeah, okay, well. Let me clarify just for this. I meant 25% uh, of the population is, uh, belongs to the petty bourgeois, which means they own the means of production, but that's a very small case scale production, uh, mom and pop kind of thing. Uh, yeah. That's what I mean. Working class. But it's is still it's person. still relating to the money that goes to our owners at the very top. And the other thing I wanted to say is that um, talking about let's see how did the Pilger thing did you did you get the address for what Pilger wrote? Um, I for I, I will remember what my point was. It was so long ago. <laughs> And I'll okay. probably I'll probably interrupt a little bit just to to remind us what we're looking for there. Okay, thank you everybody, um, and thank you for our audience on YouTube for joining us. Richard, I think you might I has a, a summary statement to make it if we, if that would be okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Alan would like to make wanna... a summary statement. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, it's yeah, okay. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> okay, so let's try to summarize some of the ideas that have been flying around in this uh, period. It's a good discussion. I think the main point that uh, Roger and I were trying to make is that we want to get away from a framing of lesser evil politics. We want to talk about the fact that right now what we're experiencing is a multifaceted political, economic, and social crisis in the United States, that both of the mainstream parties of the capitalist parties are not addressing the, the challenges and the problems that I laid out at the beginning that people are facing. And that the role of the left today is really to point out that these problems are there, that they need to be addressed, and that the dynamics between the two parties, the way that they're interacting with each other, the types of things that they're doing are only making things worse. And um, I think that what we should really keep in mind is that um, in relation to what uh, Laura was saying, is that we want to get away from this idea of Trump, 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 Trump. And we want to really get into the idea of it's, the, it's both parties that are the problem that are not addressing what's going on and that politically allowing this to continue is only gonna make things worse and worse. And I just wanna end this with one final thought. People should keep in mind, things look pretty grim right now in some respects, but uh, Mao Zedong made a very interesting point in, uh, in the 1930s when the, uh, the communists were surrounded uh, in uh, Shanghai, and uh, they looked like they were on the verge. Hundreds of thousands of them had been murdered by the uh, the Guomindang, and things were looking pretty dismal. And uh, Mao Zedong said uh, that the situation uh, um, that heaven there's great disorder in heaven. The situation is excellent, and I think that we need to keep that in mind. That in fact there is a lot that's going on right now that really show that there's a potential for for the left and for us and we just have to get out there and do it we can't do it by backing one party or the other party of the mainstream parties in order to move forward we have to put forward our own independent political position so that's the end of uh, what we have to say topic the recording uh, richard is that okay yeah yeah